my teams delivered food parcels when people were on top of them because of lockdown. Food parcels and soup kitchens and going to 210 hospitals Jeez. with speed, delivering PPEs to the, and going to the COVID wards. Mm. Fearless. Monday to Sunday, <laughs> nobody got sick. They worked their butt off. And when the the, the, the beta virus, the strain came mm. in November 2020 and people in Transkai and KZN and Gauteng were dropping dead in the car park and in the casualty and in the ambulance and in the taxi and in the house when there was no oxygen machines. My teams delivered in 48 hours 900 oxygen machines to every single hospital in Transkai. God says clearly that if you don't help your neighbor, please don't waste your time coming to pray. I don't need your prayer. Ooh. Because the essence of prayer is to bring build a sense of community. I'm Dansane in Islam that has floods. She says, Dr. Suleiman, I'm the minister of this department. I'm so embarrassed to call you. I can't release money to help those own people because of our systems. We can't release Whoa. money. Can you please help? Can you go there? I said, madam, we're already there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a minute too late, yeah. but it doesn't matter. matter. King, King David Studio Podcast. Once in a while, we get royalty in the studio, and I know he'll say he's not. But to us and to the rest of South Africans and to probably most parts of the world, they regard him very highly. We managed to get hold of a founder of Gift of the Givers. Jeez, even saying that feels like I have achieved something really big in my life. Dr. Imtiaz uh, uh, Suleiman in, the, in, the, in our studio. How are you? Fine, David. Nice being in your studio. This is uh, Pleasant, pleasantly surprised to see this, this beautiful rooms, this beautiful building. <laughs> Thank you so so much, because eh? we always talk on the radio, you and I. Yes, <laughs> it's such a such an honor. You are probably one of the most accessible, and I say this accessible, but it shouldn't be accessible person out there. Why is that? Why do you do you become so available to to so many media platforms and so forth? We media have helped build gift of the givers. Yeah. You don't forget. People who started off in the, from from your humble origins, they stood with you, they supported you, they carried you, and now if everybody knows you, to walk away, it's you know it's just unethical. Yeah. And of course, take the media part out. They are also human beings. They want to further their careers. Mm. They want to make progress. They want to have the right story. They want to make the editor happy. It's part of their growth. And when they can't get that, they get upset. They get disillusioned. You know. Yeah. And especially when people look. We everybody in the country wants to follow us, and as as part of that, journalists were up and coming. You mm. know, community radio, community newspapers. We don't turn anybody down. You don't. The most seasoned international journalists or the most upcoming junior journalists get the same treatment. Yeah. Because tomorrow you don't know that junior guy how senior he's going to become later on in life. That is so true, eh? And you've seen people grow from junior to become <laughs> editors and so forth. Yes, and also the journalists are not, you know, like business. The journalists have become our family. Mm. We have events for them. You know, they travel with us. They stay with us. They call us. They say we need a story. They are, sometimes they ask for personal advice. They ask for guidance. So it's the journalist fraternity in South Africa has become one big family with the gift of the givers. That's so so true. And and international media is is there just as much appreciation of of your efforts as as, as it is in South Africa. I won't say there's no appreciation, but you know the international media hasn't f focused when you go to the actual disaster in South Africa, because you're in South Africa and your your own media. You need your own media to cover you. I'm not interested in international media covering me. Yes, they cover me if I go to a disaster site. But in the last three years, we haven't gone to a disaster site because our teams are required in the country for COVID. Mm. But almost 1,800 doctors dying. You can't take people out of the health system. It's just criminal to, to forget your own country and go somewhere else. That's so so true. we supported people in other countries for their own disasters, you know, and sending uh, financial support, but we didn't send teams. Mm. Now with COVID settled and, you know, trying to get the health system back into place and the country, we may consider the next disaster, depending how big it is. Do you know, uh, your story is, 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 you find a lot of it, of, you know, where you've been and the things you've done. But something that stands out for me and, and, and interesting, just before you walked in, we were talking about where all of this started, not necessarily uh, the big message that you got. It, it's the, the family, the background. I, I have a feeling as humans that even from early on, our calling rings in our heads. Uh, when we're very young, we're not even aware what it is until a moment like the one you've had, which you'll tell us about, happens. Let's go back to, to, to Pochestrum. Let's go back to the family. Let's go back home. What type of setup was it? What were you born into when you when you opened your eyes and there was this family around you? Who were these people? In the old days, we all lived commun communal living. Yeah. All the sisters, the brothers, the mother, the father, the uncles, the aunties, all lived in one big yard. Business in the front, 
I was in the back. Ah. Everybody was one big family. And just as an aside, as a country, we need to go back to that model. Mm. Our kids are getting lost. Children are left untended. Attended. Teenagers are losing direction. In the old days, if somebody was losing direction, the neighbor or the friend down the road would say, you know what, I don't think your child is doing the right thing. And the mother would say, give me one shot. You know, mm-hmm. not to be for corporal punishment, but I mean, it, it was meant in a way, put him right. You know, true, we were, true. And, and, and there was so much of love and acceptance because everyone said, we're all one big family. Your yeah. child is my child. Today, you tell somebody your child is out of line, they'll say, mind your own business, got nothing to do with you. <laughs> That's so and then true. the child gets lost. And we need to go back to those values. And those are the values that we really enjoyed in Potterstrom. Everybody was in the same house. We ate together. And it was beyond the house. The whole town was one family. Mm. So if there's a wedding, you, you can't invite everybody to the wedding, <laughs> but the whole town comes and helps in the wedding. That's true. But the funeral, everybody gets involved in the funeral. And people leave and they don't feel offended if they're not invited yeah. because they understand it's it's an expensive business. You can't invite the whole town all the time. It costs a lot of money. Mm. But the friendship never breaks. They play sports together. The kids go to school together. They do business things together. They yeah. go to functions together. That's the kind of life in which you know, you learn values about each other. Mm. And then, of course, we had a business where black people were our customers. Mm. And my grandfather would say, you know what, they've always supported us. And somebody would come and say, look, I can't pay my account, but I'm hungry. My children need some food and my kids need school uniforms. And my grandfather would say, give it to them. Mm. And and he says, we won't get paid. (laughs) Uh, And then the same people come back and say, somebody died in the family, we need money for funeral. And he would say, give it to them, we won't get paid. But he says, over the last so many years, all that family have been supporting our business. That's true. So it's time to put back. So that was their way of charity to to write off debt. Mm. You know? And then sometimes above that, then when my mother came, you know, when she came to Potter's room, of course, she and my father were divorced early. She went back to Durban and she was also very charitable. She didn't have much means, mm. but she started an employment bureau. And she said, the best thing you can do is find people jobs. It gives them dignity empowers them, gives them self-sufficiency and this is the best thing you can do. So she created an employment bureau and she found a lot of people jobs and a lot of people prayed for her. Amazing. Then she told me, you know, the people that really need help don't come out to ask. We need to go and find them. So if we can afford only one food parcel, let's just do one food parcel. We make a difference to one person's life. So on a regular basis, we used to do that. So those conversations were always around you. It, it's always and also as part of the religion. You know, uh. it, it's a very integral part of the religion that you got to give charity. Charity doesn't mean money. No. It means good words, removing something from the road, helping people, assisting, giving good advice. And of course, the highest form is then if you give the money and you give of yourself. And so it, it's God says clearly that if you don't help your neighbor, please don't waste your time coming to pray. I don't need your prayer. Ooh. Because the essence of prayer is to bring build a sense of community that you need to know what's going on in the next man's house. Not as a, in, as, as a, uh, not as a nosy of, neighbor, as a, not as a nosy neighbor, <laughs> but to see if they have difficulty, if they don't ask, in a very quiet, dignified way, look into it and and help them and help them because that's what neighbor, neighborliness is all about. And those are the values we need to go back as a country. In your observation, you've you've been around a while. You're, you're not a you're not a thirty year old. <laughs> you've seen all these changes. What do you what do you think has happened to to our that communal setup that that you speak of, how did we lose it in in, in your observation? The new generation has lost it. Yeah, the old generation still tries to maintain it. When I say disrespect for the young, from the young generation to the old generation, it really upsets me, yeah. because the old generation gave their pension money, they gave their last blood, they worked hard to see the new generation go to the schools, go to university. They sacrificed everything. And a lot of the young kids forget where they come from. It's about how do I get an extensive, expensive car, get the most new phone, the branded clothes, have a nice flashy cars, have girlfriends, you know. Mm. Everybody needs to get married. But don't forget where you came from. No. You are there because those old people, and they battled for so many years with apartheid. They went through all that hardship and difficulty. The least you can do as part of spirituality and humanity is go back to your, old, your grandfather, your parents, and say, thank you for what you've done. They're not asking for much. They just want you to visit them. Mm-hmm. You bring an occasional gift, sometimes food parcels. If they're in a difficult situation, like a lot of people are in Transkai, send some money home. Yes, the older people do send money home. Mm. You know? But the younger generation, they need to come back to that. Um, it's not everybody. True. Yeah, it's not everybody. A lot of people are very caring, you know, but we need to bring that kind of values back to our... And it's, it's across all rel- religions and all races and all communities. It's not specific to one group of people. Do you feel the ship has sailed? No. Is there still time? There's always hope. Yeah, there's always hope because people 
well, we got in our, we, we had a reminder. Mm. COVID was the best reminder. True. Where people, people who were affluent, who had the money, suddenly realized, hey, I'm going through this difficulty. My shop is not busy. People are not coming. My family member has died. I can't get oxygen. The hospitals are not available. Mm. What's happening to poor people? All these years. If, if, if it's hey, like this for, for me. us, what's <laughs> happened? And I actually had people coming to me for donations and saying, you know, we we gave you money last year uh. and the year before. This year, we haven't earned one cent in three months. But we're going to give you four times the money Whoa. that we gave you last year. Amazing. From our savings. Because we now appreciate what other people are going through. And from here onwards, we will always bear in mind the difficulty of people who have hardship. And, and it, the last three years has been the best years in our history. What COVID, what wow. lockdown, what unrest, what floods, what yes. affected the economy. People have been, South Africans have been generous, so the boat has not sailed. Yeah. The fact that we are generous, we've got good hearts. We want to learn. We are willing. And there's a new pattern, that, a report has just come up. Young people, are starting to donate mm. across all groups. Really? Yes, young people are starting. And the other interesting thing is a large number of black females are, are becoming major donors in the country, which is just augurs so well for our society. <laughs> yes, that's amazing. What's happening to the black guys? <laughs> now that we're here at this moment, uh, gents, you're not donating. Something is wrong with you. What, what, what was daddy selling uh, in the shop? I'm a general dealer. Clothes and groceries, those are the common items. Uh -huh. You know, that school uniforms, fancy clothes, winter stuff, summer stuff, uh, some some material, and, and groceries, the big items, maize, rice, oil, sugar, and then tea and all the other stuff. And, well, just a range of the, 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 the staple stuff that people bought. Do we call it a, a typical Indian merchant? Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we, we used to be called general dealers. Yes, yes. Yeah. And were you a, 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 an active participant in, yes, in the business? Yes, in, in the family business, we yes. all learned. Yeah. And I think a lot of my skills came from there. When yeah. I think of it now, I learned management, I learned financial planning. Uh. At one point, my father gave me my own shop whilst <laughs> I was at school. Yes. He said, on a Saturday, you can run that shop alone. And that shop used to sell stationery during the opening of school. Okay. I could make my own prices. I could order my own Whoa. books. I, and I could serve the people. And I learned a lot of skills. And people would come and you would talk and engage with them and learn about their school and life. And you try to be the best, best prices possible <laughs> because it's competition. Everybody's competing against each other. So the prices come down. And and then after hours, we used to pack the shops, you know, organize the stuff, stock control when the stuff comes, make sure yes. you check everything. And you did that. And, I did, and all those skills I used in Gift of the Givers. Amazing. Well, now you're talking and of course, much, much bigger budgets, but yes, 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 it's the same skill. Skills are the same. Yes. And, and of course, committed to your family because they're earning and they're paying for all your stuff. Mm. So you have to play your part. That's true. And, and, and you engage with people from different race groups. You understand that their difficulties, where they come from. And even our customers, like I said, the journalists, our family, mm. the customers became our family. We knew them by their first name. We knew who married who, yeah. how many children they had, where the child went to, who <laughs> passed away, who lost his job. It was like one big... And they also had nicknames. We yeah. all knew the nicknames of everybody. That's how we built a relationship. Interesting, eh? Uh, Pochestrum, when you look back at it, uh, back in those days and now, and well, it's most parts of South Africa, I've almost decayed. Uh, when, you, when you go back home, what do you find now? A lot of my old people have passed on. Yeah. A lot of my family have passed on. A lot of those people have left it. Well, they passed on from all over. Things have changed. The new generation has gone, got uh, studies and went away to the cities like Joburg mm -hmm. and other parts of the country. It's just not the same. You know, you don't have that spirit of togetherness when you used to do things, the weddings, the funerals and all together. Yes, it's there to some extent, but not to the extent as before. There's no children going to the sports fields mm. like we used to go. The parents used to play tennis, soccer and cricket. The kids used to come and participate in it, took part in school sports, took part in all activities, always part of community. The new generation doesn't do any of that stuff. It's about phones, cars, <laughs> outing, and you don't see much sports. You, yes. The only sports you see is those kids who play sports in the school. Which is not so much. Uh, not go so much. to the township, it's days, almost nothing. We used to go to the grounds, we should take the bus, we should take the taxi. We go far, we have competitions, you yeah. know, all the different divisions, and under 8 and under 10 and under 12 and cults and juniors and seniors and mm. you know, all that kind of stuff in terms of I soccer. did ballroom dancing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that tells you. Because yeah, yeah. we used to participate in all these things. Wasn't that big in Soweto? Uh, no, I'm, I'm a Pretoria boy, so it was it, it was big. It was big in most townships, yeah, actually. Yeah. Uh, like all sport participation was big everywhere. Yes, because uh, as a child, I did I did uh, martial arts for a week. They beat me up, and I realized it wasn't for me. <laughs> I tried soccer, 
it wasn't very good. I ended up doing ballroom dancing. Can't believe I revealed that. <laughs> you didn't trap anybody. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it was. And and the size of your of 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 your family, you describe it as very very big. So there are quite a lot of people in in your setup. Is, is siblings? What 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 are we talking? When I said big family, I meant like the grandfather, his brothers, yeah. sisters. They were quite big, many. Mm. And then my father and his brother and sisters. And then me and my two sisters we were only three. Okay. We, we were the smaller part of the family. Yeah. And then my father remarried when my mother left, and so I had three siblings from there. And my mother remarried and had one brother from there. Yeah. So we were uh, seven of us, mm. right? And then of course, then our kids. I got six children, and nine grandchildren. Jeez. So you know, and all and all the other siblings. The setup is still intact. So, so the setup is intact, and the the the, the grandchildren are all are coming. So more and more. <laughs> you seem to be celebrating this this nice growth in the family as well. Yes. Yes. You know, and to me, of course. When people worry about the country and people say, "Now must we leave? Must we go?" and we see the children coming and we say, "We're not going anywhere. Yeah. You know, we need to stay here and we need to fix this thing together." And it's a call upon all our groups in the country. This is our country. Let's stand together. Let's fix things together. Mm. Let's work in the interests of each other because there's more joy and more progress in doing things together than fighting each other. The, the idea of uh, you know within Indian communities, there's always a, a conversation about being a doctor and all of that. It's a, it's quite a big calling. And which you answered quite well. Who inspired that within the family? And another doctor. Okay. He passed on last year, and he he had a double role. He was a very good GP, always smiling, after hours, weekends, any time. He came with a smile. He did house calls, treated the whole family, knew your history, knew everything about you. Mm -hmm. He actually even delivered me. Jeez. Yeah, right. So <laughs> I, was, I was delivered by his hands. Wow. And I was his his patient from from day one, from, oh. from day zero. You know. And the other thing he did is every year in Ramadan, when we have the fasting month, mm. we have extra prayers at night, and the person who reads the prayers has to know the Holy Quran by memory, you know. So oh. it, a lot of kids kids got that gift. So this guy had that gift. He was a doctor and he knew the Holy Quran by memory. Mm. So every year the community lawyers used to look at him to do the prayer. Mm. So he was a spiritual guy and a physical guy for the oh. town. One year he said he's tired, he can't do it. So the town said, okay, they'll get somebody from outside. The night of prayer came, the first of Ramadan, and nobody came from outside. Oh. He just stepped up to the plate. I'll do it. And it <laughs> was an example of you know of what humility, service, professionalism is. Mm. He then left Pottersdam. He came to Durban. He studied. He became a pediatrician. Okay. He became a professor. Whoa. And he passed on. You know, uh, last year I actually met his daughter two months ago. You know, so and he was a great example. A really committed, dedicated doctor. Did he inspire you in words or just what he was doing? And you saw him as just the example. He didn't have to speak. Yeah. His body language is good enough. Just his, his we call it akhlaq, character, you know, behavior, approach. You know, just the way he comes, the way he smiles, the way he looks at you, his bedside manner. And you look at this guy, you see you. And also his, his, his skill as mm, a doctor. Mm. Not only that, he, he was a good doctor. Yeah. And I looked at it, I said, you, I want to be like this guy. Except the religious part, I, don't do, I think I'll manage that. But that, 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 that <laughs> it's was, a little too much. A little too much. But the other part, yes, I can do. You know, talking about uh, role models, I guess it, it says a lot about the society we live in now. Because, you know, you go to the townships and where I grew up, uh, people we, look, we used to look up to where people who were driving fancy cars and we didn't know what jobs they did. And half the time they were thugs. Yeah. So there's something to be said about you, where you ended up in your life, and particularly your career as a doctor. It's, it's largely because there was someone around you to, to emulate. Yes. And, and, and I sit now and wonder, uh, and something that you spoke about as well, how we lost so much as a society. Surely we've lost that as well. Uh, this, this role modeling that's so important. We're pursuing a false kind of agenda, you know, to look at role models, expensive cars. Is that life? Materialism is not life. The best form of life is, is dedication and helping people. And I can see it now, how people appreciate, you know, the kind of, because let's put it another way. You could have been in the situation of the very poor people. Mm. And what would you want? You would want somebody to come and see you and help you and assist you and pick you up and give you an opportunity. That's it. And I find it a bit insane outrageous that people market expensive cars, the lifestyle, where they've traveled, the type of house they have, when there's so much poverty around them. Mm. People look at that and think, my situation is so bad. My heart is so sore. I can't be like that. But they're pursuing the wrong interest. Mm. A very important teaching. What you don't spend is not yours. So I can have five billion. Mm. I can give you five billion today. 
how many lifetimes are you going to need to spend that money? Yeah, yeah. yeah. lots. You can have uh, five houses, but you can only sleep in one. Yeah. You can have five cars, you use one, other four batteries are going to die. Mm. <laughs> you need, uh, you're going to eat too much food, you're going to get sick, you're going to end up in hospital. So we always say, earn in moderation, no harm, nothing wrong in earning, but always remember a share for the poor in that earning of yours, help pick somebody up. The joy of that, you can't understand unless you do it. It's like me trying to explain to somebody how beautiful something is. They won't yeah. understand until the experience itself. And I've had that experience with my medical teams. Yeah, I said, let's go out. Journalists. Journalists have traveled with me and they say, this thing is life-changing. Not the story. Mm. Not the story. The fact that what they've seen and what they've experienced and how they encountered people outside the story was life-changing. It, it, it's, people tell you, we found God when we traveled. Wow. We found spirituality. And it's so much, so much so that every mission they want to come and they don't want to do the story. Now mm. they want to distribute the stuff themselves. <laughs> they want to be doctors. They want to be the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, they want to be part of the story. Yeah. And young generation, message to everybody, we mustn't look at wealth as a source of success. Mm. We must look at values, ethics, spirituality, and morality. We've seen what happened in government circles. You've got big money. Do you want to emulate that? steal from the poor, mm. steal from the coffers and see poor people go? Is that your concept of life? Or would you like to have an honest job, earn for your family, and if God blesses you with more, good luck. Yeah. Right? But if you got, we have a teaching that if you save in your house for the night, for the night, mm -hmm. have something to eat, you know, and you got good health for the day, you've got everything. Just for, for the, the day. For the day. For the day, like the bird. Yes. You know how the bird goes for the food for the day? <laughs> for the and day. Shelter, yes. And you've got health for the day, Food for the day, a secure house, you got everything. So God is showing you how you have to be grateful for little things. Yeah. Because there are people, that's like paradise for other people. Those three simple things. Because there are people who live for years and years and years mm. without a house, without food, without opportunity. Mm. What debilitation right now, people waiting seven years for an operation in mm. this country. So you have that kind of stuff. Always be grateful and always think of somebody else. You talk about something that South Africans would struggle to identify with. Um, a simple life, relatively cheap life yes. uh, of having breath is good enough. The fact that you're able to wake up and there's a loving family around you should be good enough. You're talking about a South Africa and a South African who is very materialistic in their, in their state of mind. We've become that type of pe person. We glorify those who drive bigger cars than, than everybody else. We have bigger houses and that's why we fake that life as well. Yes, um, and, and we've become that person I've had many people sit on that very chair and I would ask them this question, what happened to us? And they say poverty will make you do crazy things. Our history is such that we had a system that deliberately held you back. Yes. And once you get a chance <laughs> to run, you're going to run faster than everybody else. At least try. I don't, I, I, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. I have a problem if you forget where you came from. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm saying run. Fly also. Jump. Yeah. You get an opportunity, grab it with three hands. Take it and run, but don't forget where you came from. Don't forget the families. Don't forget your friends and your neighbors. You got an opportunity, create an opportunity for somebody else yeah. to do the running and the flying and the jumping. No problem with that. Mm. Do it. There's no harm in earning money. But, but do it honestly, do it the right way, and always remember, pick somebody else up with you. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, well, there's a lot to be done in South Africa. A country of such poverty now, so many problems. What preoccupies you? What keeps you up at night? I don't, I don't stay up at night. But that, <laughs> I, when, when I say that, let me qualify that. Yes. Problems don't keep me up. Okay. I stay up because I'm a person that sleeps three hours a night. Mm. Not because I've got problems. It's just because I'm a hyperactive guy. Yeah. Right? And I'm driven by the need of the people in the country. And I see the hardship. I see the difficulty. I, I love it. Because that's what I do 365 days a year. I don't mm. do anything else. I'm not a guy that likes holidays. I don't like outing. I just like to be in the field. Yeah. Uh, and you can see the difference you make. What drives me is the patience of the people that are suffering. Mm. They endure the difficulty and hardship always with faith, especially the old people, with hope that something will come one day. And I remember our teams delivered something in Queenstown and an old lady in a rural area standing on a walking stick, you know, holding it up. She picked up her hands at almost sunset time mm. and she said, God, you didn't forget us. Wow. You send the people to help us. I know you won't let me down. And that's the kind of sentiment, not only in this country, we get it outside this country also, mm. where people with all their hardship and difficulty have so much of faith. We can't 
let them down. No. And that's why we call upon everybody who's got the means. Let's build this country. We owe it to them. And one of the reasons why I like to give back is I'm not on the other side. Mm. My child is safe. My family is safe. You know, we're all safe. And it's a means of gratitude. God Almighty, you give us this. These are your servants. These are your people. We're going to put back. You, you don't have to be doing this. There's a moment in your life, a story you've told many, many times, how a calling uh, came through to you and you answered the call. Share the story with us. Gift of the Givers is not my organization. Mm. I didn't get up one morning and say, okay, today, I think I'll form an organization, give it a name, get some members, write a constitution, <laughs> one, two, three, four, and five, I'm going to do. Yeah. No. I was told about a spiritual teacher in Istanbul, and in August 91, I landed up there. Yeah. And I met him, it was post Gulf War, and I saw people of all religions, all nationalities, people who don't even believe, different countries, Americans, Russians, Europeans, Africans, Australians, Canadians, Jews, Christians, Hindus, Muslims, black, white, everybody. Mm. I found it very difficult to understand this because the Gulf White polarized the world so much into different groups, and nations, and civilizations. And I'm thinking, how is this possible? They're all here. They're not fighting. Mm. They're not screaming. They're not shouting with each other. And everybody's embraced with love. I said, is this the real life? I love this. I saw the spiritual teacher. I fell in love with him the moment I put my eyes on him. Mm. I went back and my heart told me, hey, I need to go back there. Mm. So I landed back in August, the following year, August again, 92. 6th August, 1992, 10 p.m., Thursday night. Hmm. The spiritual teacher finishes the religious programs, suddenly lifts his head up, makes eye contact with me, hmm. and looks heavenwards at the same time. Oh. And he says, my son, in fluent Turkish. Uh. I don't understand a word of Turkish. But I understood every single word that he said. Wow. Yeah, my son, I'm not asking you. I'm instructing you to form an organization. The name in Arabic will be Wakful Wakifin. Hmm. Translated, gift of the givers. You will serve all people of all races, all religions, all colors, all classes, all cultures, of any geographical location and of any political affiliation. But you will serve them unconditionally. You will expect nothing in return, not even a thank you. This is an instruction for you for the rest of your life. Oh. Serve people with love, kindness, compassion and mercy. And remember the dignity. The dignity of man is foremost. Some, when somebody is down, don't push them down. Hold them. Elevate them. Wipe the tear of a grieving child. Caress the head of an orphan. Say words of good counsel to a widow. These things are free. Mm. They don't cost anything. No. Clothe the naked. Feed the hungry. And provide water to the thirsty. And in everything that you do, be the best at what you do. Yeah. Because you're dealing with human dignity, human life, and human emotion. Not because of ego. Mm. He went on to say, my son, the most important thing to remember, that whatever you do is done through you and not by you. There's no place to say, ah, I'm somebody, I did mm. this. No place for that, no place for ego. I told you, you spoke in Turkish and understood. Jeez. And I asked him, how is it that when you speak Turkish, I understand, and other people speak Turkish, I don't understand. He said, my son, when the hearts connect and the souls connect, the words become understandable. Wow. I've experienced that many times. I asked him, okay, now you told me all these things. What does it mean? What am I actually supposed to do? Mm. I'm a doctor. I've got three surgeries in a place called Peter Marisburg in South Africa. So what am I actually supposed to do? <laughs> Told me one line. You will know. Oh no. For 30 years, I do know. What to do, how to do, what not to do, what to touch, what not to touch, how to manage, how to intervene. It just comes to me and I just know exactly what to do. What to right. do? Yeah. Wow. W went you immediately after thinking, uh oh, this is too much. The statement you said, I have a century at home. I have I have employees. I have a family to feed. Didn't that unsettle you that this is just too much? The pre trip, I saw the quality of this man. Mm. And my, my love for him brought me back. And whatever he was going to say, I knew it was going to be good. Mm. I, was not, I didn't have to vet him. There was something yeah. about his spiritual aura. And I knew whatever he said was going to be work out fine. My father was. The strut. <laughs> and he said, are you sure? You studied for seven years. You're a doctor. What's going to happen? All that learning and all that teaching. Mm. And I said, I know I'm doing the right thing. And many years, he passed on now in 2016. Many years later, he says, I admire your courage and your faith. I wish I had what you have. Mm. And I'm very proud of you. So in the end, he... Not in the end, but you know, later yeah. on in life. Yeah. He said, I can see what you're doing for the people of this country and the world. I endorse you fully. I support you fully. That's the right decision you made in your life. Interesting. 
but 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 you were fine with it from the word go. Yes. From the minute you started, you knew that this is something that you actually you were fine with this uncharted territory because we have a short life. We live eighty, maybe a hundred years. If you lived long, it's relatively short yes. relative to how long uh, the universe has existed. So your stint in life and your contribution to society is one that we will remember for years. And most of us live a life that does so little. Uh, and yet you took on this huge responsibility without even doubting. Surely at some point you said, maybe this is not such a good idea. No, I never felt that. Uh. You know, I, because as I said, you will know. And that was a test of my faith. And I knew because that faith was so strong, that's the reason I do what I do. Yeah, I'm always sure it's going to work out. You know, any of these challenges, I expect challenges. That's a part of religious teaching. God says you will get grief. There'll be difficulty. There'll be challenges. There'll be obstacles. There'll be thorns. But you will succeed if you do things the right way, the sincere way, no ego, no fame, simple, just pure service for the right intention. You will succeed. It may take long, yeah. but you will succeed. And everything has worked out. You know, religious teachings become is a very big part of your life. Uh, you make reference to it a lot. Is it such that if it wasn't there, maybe some of these big decisions you probably would not have made? No, it, it, it's it's an it's an integral part of my life. Yeah, the spiritual teacher is from my religion. Mm. I have to follow somebody who follows. I, when I saw my religion, I'm happy with what I saw. Mm. <clears throat> but of course, he teaches you that you embrace all religion, you embrace all people because all religions from the same source. Mm. The God is the same. The name is different, right? So, on that basis, because he gives the broad outline. But you need to learn, learn the principles, the values, the teachings, all the laws, which is in the book itself. Mm. You know, I, I, I don't know all the rules. I mean, I'm not a qualified guy in religion. But the basic stuff of human caring, of honesty, of transparency, of dignity, of not stealing, of not hurting somebody else, of not breaking somebody's heart. Yes, we make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, we humans, we, we go, we fall off the track somewhere along the line. Yeah. But you jump out and you come back online. Otherwise, you won't be human. Mm. So you appreciate that and you, you fix yourself up if something goes wrong. But religion is absolutely the basis of everything. Paramount in yeah. your life. Yeah. You have solved so many human problems. Uh, you know, the list is, is endless. Uh, when you started, what, and I'm not really talking about some of the first things you did, what was, what was immediate in terms of human challenges that you felt this we need to address almost immediately? Well, because you said you will know. Mm. The moment I walked out of that place, the 6th of August, it came to me, respond to the civil war in Bosnia. Now, that's a crazy thing to do. You don't even form an organization. <laughs> Nothing. You haven't done a food parcel. You haven't done a soup kitchen. But you want to go into a war zone in another country. Yeah. But that's the teaching that came. Not even 10 months later, the same month in August, same month, <laughs> I took in 32 containers of aid into Bosnia. In November, I took in another eight containers of warm items. And in, in 1993, we started designing the world's first containerized mobile hospital. We were proud of it because it was African technology. Mm. Built in Africa world first, state of the art, CNN filmed it. And they said the South African containerized mobile hospital is equal to any of the best hospitals in Europe. Wow. And that was built in 93. And we took it from Africa to Europe to say we believe in our country and our continent. And from there onwards, as things came in front, somebody came to the house and said, look, while I'm talking to somebody, the wife would come and talk to my wife. Mm -hmm. and then my wife would realize, oops, there's domestic problems. There's kids that are naughty, oh. there's some other kind of issue. So she said, I think we need to start a counseling service. Oh boy. So we do all the training, we bring the people, and it takes two years, we set up a counseling service. And every project we set up expands and grows. Mm. Support groups, going out, outreach teams, all that kind of stuff, trauma counseling, it just keeps growing. Every project we set up grows. We've got 21 different categories of projects. Mm. Then somebody came and said, you know, I'm an old lady, I go to preschool kids, they're very hungry, I need some stuff for a soup kitchen. <laughs> So we start one soup kitchen and suddenly 80, 80 90, 100 preschools come and we expand <laughs> the program. And then a hurricane hits in Penley in 1994, Christmas Day, and a floods hit Peter Marisburg, Edendale floods in 1995, Christmas Day. Jeez. And that day, I was, we were, our car was packed, we were about to leave for the burg. The rain came. And, and the good thing happened is my house was just done up. Mm. And there was something wrong with the drainage system and all the water came right into my house. Ooh. And I said, you know what? This has happened here. What has happened on the other side? My wife and family took all the stuff out of the car. Mm. We're going to eat in there. We're <laughs> going to have these people for Christmas because all the food parcels are gone. Oh boy. The same thing happened the year before in a Christmas Day in, 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 in Impenle and Christmas Day the following year in floods in Edendale. 
and we got involved with the communities. We took the kids what to learn, to see how to do stuff, pack a parcel, take the stuff mm. in your car and deliver it because we didn't have big, big uh, trucks and all that yes. time. It, it, was, it was an evolution, of course. What's now compared to then is just, just no comparison. Mm. So we did it. And it was those kind of things that God showed us. Okay, now you respond to a disaster. Now you give a soup kitchen. Then somebody would come in. That's, that's there you will know. Yeah, you'll talk. And, yes. and it comes to you. I mean, COVID came to us. Yeah. <laughs> and now what happens? The, the municipality from Abeja calls and says, we've got a water, water problem. Issues. Day zero. Yes. Can you come? So we go and we put 45 bowls. <laughs> we get a call from Sutherland. We spoke on the radio about it. Yeah. That. <laughs> the sheep are dying in Sutherland. So we send in fodder. The bees are dying in Nazareth after the fire. So we send in 300 beehives, 30 <laughs> tons of sugar, money for plants and money for nectar pollen substitute and support a research center. So everything comes to us. It's Makanda. There's no water. The university is going to collapse. So it little bowls. Mm. So whatever challenges come, it becomes a part of an ongoing project. It doesn't stop there. Then school kids, okay, storm took place in Amtata. You know, a lot of houses destroyed. Kids got no uniform. No clothes, broken buildings. Okay, send the stuff in. Let's support. Masi Pumulele, big fire. It's 1,800 people displaced. Mm. They need stuff. As an aside, what I found in recent times, when we respond to a disaster, the thing that stands out strongly, people say, don't worry about everything else. Just give us food. Mm. And I'm thinking, the fire was only two hours ago. How are you so hungry? And then we understand that these people who are living in those systems have been hungry for a very long time. And we say, you know what? Don't feed only the fire victims, feed the neighbors too. Because whilst they're hungry, show the other guys are hungry too. Yeah. When you bring a food parcel, not for the victims only, for the neighbor too. And that's our policy, not from now, it's for some time. You know, when you describe, and you literally touched on probably 1% of the stuff that you've done over the years, you, you, you make the impossible seem so easy. Uh, and even when you speak of them, you speak of them as, yeah, we did this, we did that, we did that. Do you sometimes look at it and say, how the hell do we pull this off? Because it seems so big. I, if, I, I, if there was a disaster now in my street, I would struggle to make big decisions that you make every day about a country that you've probably never even been to. But to be fair to you, I'm a disaster specialist. I'm doing this for 32 years. That's right. well, that's right. true. Right. So I've learned. But you, you were not that at no, some point. No, no. I, well, I learned from the first day. As the teacher said, you will know. From yeah. the first day, I knew. 85% of what I know today, I learned with the first mission. A war mission, everything, international transfers, uh, trans, uh, customs duty, in diplomacy, passports, visas, warring factions, safety, mm -hmm. security, all that kind of stuff. You know, getting the right goods, appropriate stuff. You know, I learned a lot of that in the, in the first mission. First mission, yeah. yeah so th there's a reason why the inspiration came, go to Bosnia. Yeah. So th as the days, years ago, you'll be ready for everything else. So, yes, it looks easy, but it's years of experience and I have good teams. Mm. And we go for the best. We get the best hydrologists, the best drilling teams, the best building construction teams. We're right now in Charlotte. We're doing a 50 million rand upgrade. At our, I was there today. Mm. It looks incredible. Wow. The, the guy from the PMS office was there and he said, you, what is this? You know, <laughs> it's world-class quality. Yeah. DBSA, the, the Development Bank of Southern Africa, saw the plans and saw the stuff. They said, you guys are in another league altogether. So even we're an NGO, we put status in an NGO. Mm. So you think this only business can do. We, because the teacher said, Whatever you do, be the best yeah. in what you do. We don't ever compromise on that. The quality of the food we give, our staff eat the same food. Yesterday, a journalist made a comment. I just asked the management guy, said, you guys are eating the same food that you're giving the people on the ground. Mm. He said, we won't give them what we ourselves won't eat. Wow. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I've spoken to you many times on the radio. Uh, I've read up on a lot of stuff that you've done. And when I hear you speak of these things, and that's why there's so many awards, but one of the first things you say when, when you react to their words, <laughs> there's a team. It's a typical Nelson Mandela comment. I didn't do this alone. Yes. Uh, and you say that a lot. Even uh, when you were awarded, uh, uh, what award was that? I found a social justice champion. Yeah, last year, yeah. Yes, exactly. Almost immediately you said, I'm not alone here. There's a huge team. Give me, give me a sense of this team that you speak of. Before that, why do I say that? Mm. The teacher said first, it's done through you. Second, and not by you. Yeah. Secondly, he said the eye can't do the work of the ear. The ear can't do the work of the head. Mm. The head can't do the work of the heart. The heart can't do the work of the hand. The hand can't do the work of the leg. But if all these things don't function, the body falls apart. That's true. So in everything that we do, my teams are all those different parts of the body. They work together, they gel together, and they commit it together. You want to know about the teams? They are not people who do this for a job. Mm. They do this because it's a calling. 
because if you want to do this for a job, you're going to run away. You know, I'll call you on Christmas Day just as you get home to about to eat your food <laughs> parcel. I need you back. Christmas Day floods in Edendale, floods in 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 my in Soweto in 2010. My daughter was getting married. I was at home. I had my house full of guests. My offices were closed. My daughter's getting married the next day, and we got a call of floods in in Soweto. My teams. I was my guests were in the house, and I was outside coordinating <laughs> my teams and bringing them back to work. Wow! And they come back with a smile to work. To me, the the greatest example of dedication is COVID, when everybody was scared, mm-hmm. when medical guys were scared in hospitals. My teams delivered food parcels when people were on top of them because of lockdown. Food parcels and soup kitchens, and going to two hundred and ten hospitals Jeez. with speed, delivering PPEs to and going to the COVID wards, mm. fearless. Monday to Sunday, <laughs> nobody got sick. They worked their butt off, and when the the the, the beta virus, the strain came mm. in November 2020, and people in Transkei and KZN and Gauteng were dropping dead in the car park and in the casualty and in the ambulance and in the taxi and in the house when there was no oxygen machines, my teams delivered in 48 hours 900 oxygen machines to every single hospital in Transkei. Whoa. They drove at night, and of course, as part besides the teams, we have to look at the other side. The CEOs of the hospitals mm. then say the staff at the gate must wait for it. The CEO of the hospital waited himself for the machine ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock at night, and took it and put it on the patient. And we saved every single life on every single machine. Amazing. So, and then that's the the permanent staff, the medical teams, the search and rescue teams who come and go. Those are the volunteers. Yeah. yeah. Then and there's a core group of them, you know. And they put their hand up for every disaster. Now you need to understand mm. that these guys got very expensive homes, they got very expensive cars, they live in the most expensive suburbs, mm. they got higher life, they travel on business class. When they travel with us, you're going to sit in a cargo plane, yeah. you're going to sit in some small dingy plane, you're going to sleep outside with gunshots all over the show. <laughs> and yes, sewage, no functional toilet, no proper water, no place to stay, nobody to protect you. You're on your own. Mm. And so, they take this in their strides, and they come. The same guys put their hands up uh. over and over again. We want to go back. I told you in the beginning, the journalists have said, and they said, we find God, we find spirituality in these missions. And when we go, we don't give, yeah. we get, we receive. Wow. When they see, they look in the people's eyes and how the people receive them. I went to Syria. It's Arab culture that the guest has to be looked after. Mm-hmm. So I go to this camp. It's freezing. Ooh. I'm not the guy that likes winter. <laughs> It's ice cold, you know. And this child is walking around only with her underpants, a girl, a vest, no clothes, mm. and she comes to me with a bowl of olives. So I tell my uh, host, like my guy, the guy, what is this for? Mm. So he said, "You could eat it." I said, "These people haven't eaten food of the war. If I eat this child's olives, what olives this child could have to eat?" <laughs> yes. Then my friend, that's not your problem. You are the guest. You're the guest. And you're going to offend the child if you don't eat the olives, David. Uh. I knew that all of it is getting stuck in my throat. <laughs> I couldn't eat it because you felt bad. I felt I'm taking this child's food away. Yes, and the, I was in Yemen, and a lady was fighting and shouting and screaming. It was it was prayer time at Ramadan, mm. and we went to many houses. And at prayer time, we suddenly realized there was no food in any of the houses. Mm. It didn't strike us there; everything was dark. So the lady screaming in the streets, and asked my guy, "Why is the lady screaming like this?" She, she, he said, "She's screaming at all the other neighbors to say that you her guest." Oh no! Because you are a foreigner and you are a guest. Uh. So I said, you know what? This lady's got nothing in the house. It's fasting time. If I eat her food, what is she going to eat? Yeah. So he said, look, there's the letter of the law in the religion says you mustn't lie, and the spirit of the law is you don't break a heart. Mm. So <laughs> which one do you? I said, you, I said you God, it's prayer time. It's time of fasting the break. Sorry, we'll deal with it in the year after. <laughs> but I'm going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell the guy, tell the lady. I've been invited for supper by somebody else. Mm. I can't break that trust no. or that invitation. So I'm very sorry. If I come back next time, I will eat with you, which is a big lie, you know. Yeah. But a spiritual teacher said the spiritual law is more important than the letter of the law because you didn't break somebody's heart, mm. and that's the essence of religion. You don't break anybody's heart. Jeez, man. I I listen to you, and I and I I wonder. I wonder about us South Africans because. The spirit. If we were to multiply you at sixty million times, we would have a very different country. You may not necessarily every day see yourself as the savior, but there are people who look at you, and that's why they call you to say, "Do you want to come here and help us here?" There are people who look at you as a savior, and if we embodied the spirit of uh, Dr. Mtiasa uh, Suleiman on a daily basis, 
we would live in a very different country. Or let me say this, the spirit of gift of the givers then. Let's, let me divorce it from you for one second. We would live in a very different country. How difficult is it for us to achieve that state of mind? Or is our system so contaminated? No, 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 it's coming. I've, I've seen, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of, it's just that the other guys don't get the press and the media and the coverage because they're not big. Mm. There's a lot of people who do a lot of good in this country. I was at an event recently. It was like recognizing women, mm. you know, and my wife got that award at that e event. But every woman who came there had a, a beautiful story how she took care of preschool people, mm. elderly people, somebody had trouble, took found money, took people to hospital. May not be big things. But for that person that you help, it's the biggest thing that has happened in their life. That's true. They don't need anything else to happen. So the schools want to emulate. I've been invited. I've done 151 talks this year. Jeez. And this, everybody, this is the 152nd. <laughs> <laughs> people want to know about the story, yeah. about how to help, how to give hope to people. How can emulate you? People say, how can we follow you? And of course, take the medical teams. Those who are ordinary people. Mm. And that number has multiplied into the hundreds where because we helped all the hospitals, now the guys in the hospitals are saying, please use us. We are part of your team, wherever you want us. And there's a new spirit coming in the country. Right now, my biggest emphasis is health. Because there's nothing more important than health. And COVID showed that to us. Mm. Private hospitals are saying, okay, we can give you awards for free. And we can give you theaters for free. Whoa. Bring the patients from the public service and you can do them. But... They can't stay here for more than two or three days. You need to take them back to the hospital. That's fair. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. You can, we, we want to try to encourage our own private doctors to do the procedures. If not, you bring your teams and come. Mm -hmm. And we did something. It wasn't a private hospital, but we did something in uh, Robert Magalir, so Sobakwe Hospital mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Kimberley. My team member is the head of surgery in, in the hospital. And it says, as much over, as over, we are overworked, there's people battling here for weeks, waiting for, and for months and for years, waiting for catch-up surgery, and which has been delayed because of COVID. Yeah. And, and before COVID too. So I said, what do you need? He said, look, we've got surgeons who are willing to work after hours, no extra pay. They're hospital surgeons, they're public servant doctors. <laughs> I said, that's admirable. He said, we, got, we don't have anesthetists and we don't have scrub sisters, mm. but we got the theaters, we got the consumables, we need some consumables, and we got the after-case stuff. Can you help? Yeah. I just put it on my list. But in five minutes, so five said, scrubs, I'll, I'll come through. Five scrub sisters, five anesthetists. We only wow. needed ten. We put them on a flight. We send them to Kimberley. In sixty hours, they wiped out seventy-one operations. <laughs> and more and more people are calling. How can we do this? We want to expand the programs throughout the country to do catch-up surgery. I'm talking to the CEOs of hospitals, private hospitals, medical aid societies. How do we all get involved? So to answer your question, just from that one sector, everybody wants to make a difference. Yeah. I spoke at the teachers' event. The teachers said, "You motivated us. We retired teachers. We all want to come back." We want to do something. I spoke to the SAPS, you know, the launch of this, you know, the festive season, six safety yes, security. Yes. The minister asked me to come and speak there. When we finished off and other places, the cops were retiring said, we don't retire anymore. <laughs> we want to serve the community in an honest, integral way. Wow. So it is coming. The, the mm. change is coming. The mindset change is coming. More kids. Uh, that report I told you, youngsters, more and more youngsters are donating. Black females are donating. Mm, mm. You know, other, uh, the other groups, of elderly groups are donating more. In, in times of hardship, difficulty, lockdown, COVID, the donations are still there. Mm. So the good, the inherent goodness is there in it's the country. There. And it's, in, it's there in all of us. It's, it's in, across race, religion, color. Yeah. You know, with a civil unrest. Within 48 hours, the same groups that affected each other were working with each other, providing food, bottled water, clothing, you know, helping each other. It built an, a nation. And the same areas that got hit with the looting got hit by the floods. Yes. And the people <laughs> embraced each other. They saved each other. They helped each other. They supported each other. We must not allow politicians and people to cause conflict between us mm. and give them a clear message, you are a traitor. Yeah. Anybody who tries to destabilize the country, you're a traitor and an anti-patriot. You will steal money, you're a traitor because you're robbing the poor people. We, we as communities should not allow that to happen. Should silence any politician, any councillor, any group that wants to cause friction between us. Have you had challenges with, uh, with the political class? No. Where you struggle to gain access and no, for, for no other reason but to destabilize you? No. They won't even try it. Yeah. Yeah. Because we've got the support of the entire country. But besides that, government knows that I'm blunt, I'm straightforward, we fight in the day, we're friends in the night. And who calls us? Every time there's a disaster, it's the government that calls us, <laughs> nobody else. Yeah. Yes. And they know they have to turn to us. But I say, I emphasize, there's a lot of good people in government. Yeah. There's a lot of good guys in the political parties. There's a lot of good guys in the civil service. There's a lot of South Africans everywhere who want to do good. So we dare not to show anybody up. 
we're there because the people need us. And we've got the skill and we can do it. In fact, we renovated so many hospitals during COVID with no memorandum of understanding, yeah. no agreement, nothing Spoked in writer. In and and the health, health department is so difficult to work with and they just look the other way. And you know, <laughs> and, 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 and when people say it's gift of the givers coming, ah, don't worry. Let yeah. them do it. It's fine. No problem. Mm. Wow. Do you sometimes, with a typical attitude of most South Africans, that there's enough money in government, there's enough resources in government. We are not the poorest country in the world. Uh, we're actually quite, quite well resourced. Uh, do you sometimes feel, but they should be doing this themselves. There's, there's money for this. Why are we doing this? Do you sometimes have that feeling as most South Africans? Feel? No, you need to look at it in context. Yeah. You see, the tax base has been eroded. A lot of high net worth people have left the country. Mm. Seven million people's taxes can't look after 65 million people. It's impossible. Yeah. So it's not who the government is. It could be Australians, Germans, Americans, Canadians could be running the country. They're going to have the same problem. Mm. Because if you don't have a tax base, you don't have the resources to fix things. Mm. If you have a civil unrest, you have floods and floods again, and you have COVID, you don't have this extra budget to pay for the normal things that you're supposed to pay for. Now you're 200 billion rand behind. And, and SAA eats your t billions of rands. And ESCOM eats your billions of rands mm -hmm. in fuel. Not their problem, not their fault that this diesel price went up. You know, of course, the government's failure is to look, look it has failed in maintenance. And that's the general rule that all of us South Africans, maintain your house, maintain your car, maintain your building. We should all do that. Mm -hmm. We've learned from the past. We can't stay in the past now. Let's go forward and fix the things and do maintenance. So they can't do it, and that's why they need the support of South Africans who have the means. We're not doing it for government. Mm. We're doing it for the sake so, of the people. Yeah. But allow me to to, to to have on this point, because it's a typical South African conversation, this, where you know for sure there was money available for disaster in the floods. I remember reading the story that said, uh, a National Treasury said, yeah, we've allocated money for this. Uh, we're just waiting for administrators to come and sign it out. And they haven't been here. And you go to KZN, and I happened to go to KZN three weeks after disasters. I remember some of the roads were still closed. And, and they said, yeah, nothing has happened. Not a single thing has happened. Treasury says, yeah, money is available, but nothing has happened. Uh, and, and I, I don't want to use the C word, <laughs> corruption. It's a part of our system. And, and that's why I say it wouldn't be surprising, and I know you wouldn't do that, for you to say, but guys, you should be sorting this out. And you don't get to that point. Why is that? Several reasons. One, government is entangled in its own systems. And I've told it to ministers, I, face to face, I've engaged them. I said, your systems are a mess. You guys got the best constitution. I said, you guys, it's not their country. It's, it's, it's our country together. But I said, as, since, since you guys are in charge now, you guys got the best constitution. You got the best ideas, the best policies. But your systems of unlocking, you know, making, I mean, let's take an example. Mm. A minister calls me. I'm Dansane in East London has floods. She says, Dr. Suleiman, I'm the minister of this department. I'm so embarrassed to call you. I can't release money to help those own people because of our systems. We can't release oh. money. Can you please help? Can you go there? I said, madam, we're already there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of You're a minute too late, yeah. but it doesn't matter. Of, so, And the problem is because of these checks and balances, see, when you, the Disaster Act allows you to break all rules. Mm. So I don't understand when they declare a national disaster, why they don't act instantly. And I, and I always tell government, there's three words you guys don't understand. Urgency, emergency, and disaster is not in your vocabulary. Yeah. When you declare a disaster, you can't be responding nine months later. No. The point is exact. You can't have a, a, a three-week meeting. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I, and, and the problem is now, who's going to get the money? And, you know, who's going to benefit from yeah. the money? And who's getting need, the contract? <laughs> they need to change that system and find a far more efficient way. Because at the end of the day, while you're haggling, the poor guy is still sitting in the community hall. There's still hundreds of people in a small place or 15 of them in, in a family man's house, which, which is a recipe for family unrest and, you know, and, and disturbance in, mm. in the family. And, 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 and a lot of social issues. issues yes. yeah, so you've got the money, find a system to improve it. And those are the kinds of things you should be looking for, you know, looking at. Mm. They're more worried about who the, the, the new conference guy is going to be, who the new deal leader is going to be, who's going to be the next counselor, how to step aside, rumors go aside. You must make a distinction that, yes, you're a political party, but when it comes to country, the country comes first, not your political party. Because your political party has a couple of million people. The mm. country has 65 million people. So your allegiance is to the people, not to the party. Yes, you, you don't go wrong. You follow the system. But your party can't cripple you to the extent that the country becomes dysfunctional. But that's where we are now. But that's what we've got to fix up. Jeez. Yeah.
<laughs> I think uh, Dr. MTS4, Minister of Disaster. <laughs> there's a there's a portfolio <laughs> for you. Minister of Disaster, Dr. MTS Suleiman. The size of your organization surely it gets a lot of respect. That's why you would get a call from a minister. That's why you'd get doctors would say, I'm coming yes. without a difficulty. Have you had times earlier on where it wasn't as easy to get people to to, to rally people are, are around you? No. We, 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 it, it's, it's a scale. Mm. So when you start off, you say, okay, let, let, let's go a little beyond that, be behind that. What, whatever you do, you have to be realistic. Yeah. Don't take on something that is far bigger than you and have expectations that will destroy you. So I have a policy. If I'm going to an earthquake, mm. my focus is only on one street. What happens on the other side is not my problem. Mm -hmm. right? I can't save everybody. True. But the street that I take, I must make sure that I do a damn good job on mm -hmm. the street. And somebody else will take street two and street three. If I finish street one properly, I'll try street two. Yeah. With still time and resources and help somebody else. If I try to do all three streets, I'll do nothing. I won't help anybody. Wow. So in the same way, when you start with a mission, it's the first one, the first medical mission we were trying. Okay, let's take seven guys. Mm -hmm. To get seven guys is easy because you studied with people. They came. Mm -hmm. They came back and stole the story. And the next time, there were 14 guys. The third mission, there were 30 guys. The fourth mission, there were 60 guys. Wow. The next mission, I can have 400 guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now you have more than you can even... But you know what's the best part? Yeah. I get calls from guys in Australia, wow. Canada, UK, America, parts of Africa, Singapore, Hong Kong. We've seen what you guys do. Can you please incorporate us in your team? Yeah. I said, but i got too many South Africans who want to go. <laughs> uh, I can't put anybody else inside here. Yeah. Gift of the Givers... Uh, is probably one of our greatest exports. You know, we've done well with Trevor Noah and many other uh, actors and actresses and Shelley Theron. You can't, uh, we, you, we can't for a second not acknowledge that Gift of the Givers is a great uh, product that South Africans export. And when we say South Africans export, essentially we're saying yourself and your team. And, and, and the respect and the support clearly you get from everywhere else in the world is probably, as you say, just as much as you get in South Africa. Am I correct? Yes, to so those countries that know us, it, it's growing. It's mm. been growing. I met people from the airport, and you know, in the airport, and came running to me. And I can say they're foreigners. Mm. They say, hey, they know my name. Mm. The gift of the givers, I know everything about you. <laughs> foreigners, right? And, and uh, the other thing is, we've had a lot of respect from embassies. Yeah. Especially in the last two years, the ambassador themselves, don't say a virtual meeting, don't say come to me. The ambassador comes to your head office. Wow. You know, it doesn't come to your office in Joburg. We don't have an office in Pretoria. Mm. It doesn't come to our office in Joburg. From the embassy, comes to our office in Madisburg. Takes a what? drive or flies and comes. We had the German, the Canadian. These Australian. are embassies. These, These are, are ambassadors. <laughs> are coming. You're a Europe country. You're on your own. <laughs> uh, and they appreciate what we do. Yeah. And, and they've taken notice. The embassies have taken notice all over. Who's your biggest uh, supporter? Because to finance your projects is ridiculous people of South Africa. Do you know, when you walked in here, we had notes on our computer and you immediately corrected our notes. You said, ah, that, that story is old. What you have there is old. Yeah. Uh, and we, we had, I don't know, I don't know, maybe 15 million, 66 million, 166 million. Uh, Sheikh just corrected me there. And you immediately said, no way, that's like so little. To fund, let me ask this this way. So far, what type of monies do we talk to talk about that has passed through your disaster solutions, so to speak. 4.5 billion and climbing. On a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, on a daily basis. You know, uh, uh, it's it's happening all the time. And you know what? As a policy, we don't have fundraisers. Ah. We, because the so you don't have no one that is putting together a presentation right no. now to go and knock at someone's door. We don't and say, knock on somebody's door. We don't phone anybody. We don't make handbills. We don't make pamphlets. We get lots of media coverage. So the only presentation we make is when corporate companies call us and say, look, what projects have you got? Ah. We want something in the health field. Okay. Or we want something in the drought field or something in the education field. Can you put something together so we can analyze it and see how much we can give towards that? Mm. And sometimes we'll tell them, but you know what? The project you want is not making sense. It's not workable. Okay, you suggest something. <laughs> you know, And that's a new thing that corporate mentality is changing towards what's more practical and relevant and effective. And they've quite willingly doing that. Yeah. Now there's a new phenomenon. The year is not even out. Please, can we have meetings in November and even into December, right up to the 15th and, uh, and onwards, we want to know what we want to fund next year, yeah. which never happened before. There is, that's why I said there's a mind shift change. 
There's compassion in commercialization mm. where capitalist South Africa is understanding the value of human capital from a spiritual point of view and from a compassionate point of view. Yeah. And they're taking care of their own staff first and the families of the staff in their areas and then the rest of the country, which is a great thing that this, this transformation has come, that yes, we can make money, but don't forget the people that help us make this money. You, you keep going back to COVID being one of the triggers of the state of mind that we have. It was. That's, all it, it, that's where it all started. The first time in my life, because I always tell the corporates, you guys have a CSI division, the guys are not serious. Mm. They want, okay, 90% BE points. Mm. They, 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 they take boxes. They take the ticks of boxes. I said, you guys, you guys are not even touch in reality what that's going on in the ground. I said, but for the first time during COVID, the CEOs of companies called and said, forget all those things. We're not interested in all those things. In fact, the research was done now. Tax certificates is lasting on the people's mind. Mm. The only thing is, our community is in distress. What do we need to do? How much do you need? Wow. And if one guy calls me, I say, okay, but when every corporate tells you that. But to me, the defining moment was 11th April 2022, this year, when the flood waters were raising rose eight meters in 45 minutes in some <laughs> places, and the people started to struggle. I'm expecting the guy for me. I need a helicopter. I need a boat. I need a diver. You were I'm, there in second. I'm waiting. No calls <laughs> like that. You didn't? Not one. The only calls I got up till one o'clock in the morning was from corporate South Africa. Our people are in trouble. They need help. What do you need and how much do you need? So I told the guys, are you guys feeling well? So they asked me why. I said, since when have you guys stood up at night to give away money? <laughs> this never happened. And you guys sit up at night, you'll stay up all night to make money, mm. to give away money. That's the first. <laughs> wow. And they said, we learned from COVID. We saw the hardship. We saw the lockdown. We saw the difficulty. We went through the difficulty. We now understand what other South Africans go through. Yeah. And we want to help. It's instant. David. You don't have to make a <laughs> call the, when a fire comes. Sometimes we know there's a fire because the corporate has called us. Yeah, you I didn't said, know about the, the fire. the fire? No, the fire is, yeah. How much do you need? I said, what fire? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh. This is a turn in the tide, eh? Yes, Completely. Yes. Completely. And it, naturally, you would appreciate this because this is a new wave. But doesn't this wave now saying, wait a minute, I can't handle any of this gifts that are coming, so to speak. Or you, you immediately have to put systems in place to accommodate. We, 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 can, we can do billions more yeah. because we know what needs help. We know it's very simple. Hospitals need upgrades. Yeah. Schools need upgrades. We need to put fun kids to become teachers. Mm. We need to find kids to become special education needs teachers because there's kids with learning difficulties. They'll never make progress in life. That's it. We need to fund paramedics, nurses, <laughs> OTs, psychologists. So we can put hundreds of millions of rents into that. But after they qualify, whilst the government, that's why I said, give government four years mm. to fix their systems. Mm. So for the next four years, let's help them. Yes. Let's say, okay, now one corporate pay for the kids to study. The other corporate will, or four corporates get together and pay the salary. Mm. So, okay, so a governing body post or something, <laughs> let's pay the salary. In the same way, our biggest problem in the health system now is government has cut the post of registrars. Registrars are those guys who become specialists mm -hmm. in the medical field. Mm -hmm. So if there's less registrars, it means less specialists, less academic medicine, less research, poor quality care for the, for the patients, yeah. burnout. Essentially, our future doesn't it's look gone. very and, and, and And that's upwards. Downwards, there's no teaching because the junior kids are dependent on the registrar to train them. Mm -hmm. While the registrar is training, he passes the skills on lower down. That's it. So I make a call to corporate South Africa. I say, I know it's a very difficult sell because it's supposed to be the government's job, mm -hmm. but... Government's got no money, yeah. 7 million people, 65 million people to support, look after is not possible. Let's give government four-year support. Let's fund 500 registrars. Wow. Each registrar is 1.2 million salary per year to the, the government uh -huh, rating. Uh -huh. We can't give less than the other guys. Pay them the same one, but I need a compartment for four years. It takes four years to study. So you give us, five, there's easy 500 companies yeah. can afford 1.2 million in this country. <laughs> it's not a lot. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> but can you imagine what it will do to the health system? Each registrar can see 40 patients a day. Whew. That's 12,000 patients of highly Ill, critically ill people wow. in, in, in one year from one registrar. Jeez. Can you see them? It changes life. changes the face of health. People go back to work earlier, mm. economically active, they're more positive. You know, a man can say, I can go back to work to prevent, for, to pr produce and provide for my family. I feel empowered. I feel good. The mindset change and the positive energy will come just from that one investment. We yeah. don't have to look at 100 other things. And, yeah, and you take that model and apply it in other areas as well. Yes. Wow. Do you know something that comes across quite a bit also now with what you do? Because uh, in the past, you would walk into a disaster, do the best you can, and walk out. But I've noticed now there's 
you stick around a little longer uh, to try to help other issues related to uh, post disaster challenges. Yes. What what led to that? And when did you when was it was it a clear decision that you made? No, it's all it's all dependent on resources. Yeah. Like I told you, I can only do one street when I go to area. Of course. But when we were small, we only got money for fifty food parcels, mm. not more than that. So there's no point going there and doing all the research and people think you're coming back next week and you're never coming back again. That's wrong. So when we go back now, when we go. We have a three to five day policy. Mm. We stay with the people for three to five days. We give them their food, their hot meals. And by that time, most of the people with informal settlements put in 24 hours that houses rebuilt, mm. right? So that's the first thing we do. Then we say, okay, you need toiletries, you need hygiene, you need toothpaste, you need a toothbrush, you need a roll on, you need a soap, we need a towel, we'll give you that. Mm. Then that's why you need a hall. But when you go back to your house, you're going to need a mattress, a blanket, some new clothing, we'll mm. give that to you. But my kids lost the school uniforms, they got burnt out, mm. they can't go to school. Okay, we'll give you that and shoes and we'll give you the stationery. Then, when I was in Masipa Mulele two weeks ago, at the fire, the mm. same place. After a long time, I walk in the fire. I get a stench of sewage. Yeah. I go into the house and the guy is rebuilding and the ground is wet. So I said, my friend, are you going to put your stuff on this wet ground? Mm. So he says, what am I supposed to do? Mm. So I said, how can you solve the problem? He says, cement. Yes. The concrete. Put concrete. a slab. Yes. So I said, uh, can't you do that? He looks at me. He says, <laughs> I'm a poor man. How can I do that? Yeah. I was there. I told my teams, tomorrow, deliver one pocket of cement to every house. And we did it. Jeez. And we brought in building material. And we brought in the sheets. Wow. And we brought in the nails. And we said, pull the house. But as an aside, a message I want to give informal settlements. Let's space our houses out. Yeah. Why have the, the, the tragedy of this burning and losing all your life's possessions? Let's set up, like you had ward committees in the old days, set up informal settlement committees, mm -hmm. executive, executive council, and we say in street one, we're going to build 50 houses, one meter, 1.5 meter apart mm -hmm. in every, every direction. If one house burns, other houses don't burn. That's true. We keep a gap between the first row and the second row. If a fire engine can come through. Can drive through. An ambulance can come through smoothly. And we say, okay, once it's 200, in this space, we can't take any more. Mm. You control crime. You don't allow bad behavior. You discipline people. And you say, not more than this is allowed. Mm. And this is not a model that can't work. I saw it in St. Albans, a school in Tabeja. Mm. I went to the school. And I told the teacher, we're going to put all these balls out, but, you know, informal settlement here. I'm not saying the informal settlement people are bad, but criminals hide in that mm -hmm. place. And you've got no fence here. Informal settlement guys came out, committee members. They said, there's no fence here because nobody will steal anything here. Whoa. <laughs> this school is our school. Our kids go to this school. We protect the school. In this informal settlement, there's no overcrowding. Mm -hmm. There's no crime. People just can't walk in and out of here. So you've seen this I, I, It can work. And then a guy is painting the wall of the school. So I said, my friend, uh, you're a painter? He said, yes. I said, like, how much are you charging for this? So he says, I'm not charging for this. Mm. So I said, where do you work? He says, I got no job. Where do you live? I live in an informal settlement. Mm. This is my payback to the school because wow. it looks after my kids. Wow. We got it in South Africans. <laughs> we got it. We just need to apply the system. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Jeez, you you know something that comes across as you tell these stories is how how sharp your memory is <laughs> about all these things that you've had you've done over I the years. I live in the field. Yes. I don't live in an office. You don't live in an office. No. Storage. Where do you store? I got big warehouses. Yeah, I got we got sixty five vehicles. We got our own fleet of trucks. We have trucks, yes. We have trucks. We have water tankers. We have buckets. We have water trailers. We have vehicles. We don't. We don't use cars. So when you deploy, you start with your stuff first. But let me put it this way. Let's take Yagas Fontaine, mm. the dam, Tidings Dam that collapsed. Yeah. In less than eight hours, I had teams already arriving from East London, Hrafnet, Bethlehem, Jeez. Johannesburg, and Peter Marysburg. <laughs> That's the speed at which we move. Wow. In, Amt in Imtata, when they had the disaster, I sent in trucks from Hrafnet, Cape Town, Joburg, and Devon, and they got to Amtata before the disaster management, which is 30 minutes away. What? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> do you do you have a committee of decision makers? What happens? It's, say there's a disaster right now. It's This it conversation stops. I'm the boss. This conversation stops, yep. basically. You have calls to take. It's simple. We, we, it, 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 my staff don't even wait for me. Mm. They, they already know. They know. They know the, 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 the drill. You know what? It's a disaster. People have called us. They're in trouble. They need help. City council has called us. Nobody else is going to do it. Yes. We're going to respond. The guy in Dale tell me already. They sent me pictures with them on site already. <laughs> <laughs>
Wow. So, and sometimes we're responding to multiple disasters at the same time. Right? I was about to say, yeah, do, you, do you ever have to toss a coin between disasters? No, 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 no. We, we, we respond to all. And when the cyclone Idai came, we had teams in Mozambique, in Malawi, in Zimbabwe, and we had floods in Durban, and none of the other normal projects suffered. Nothing stops. The rule is nothing stops. Is it largely because, going back to where we started, largely because there's a lot of volunteer, vo 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 people who just volunteer their service No, team. I don't have volunteers. The only volunteers I have is the disaster teams. Yes. The medical and the search and rescue. That's more for international disasters. Mm. But my staff are all full-time staff. How big is your staff? 90. Wow. 90 full-time staff. There's the truck drivers, the packers, the, the social media guys, the accountants, the, the phone people, you know, and the cop to a whole corporate team that presents all the reports to, to see how we spent your money. Yes. And, and then... To, to, the, to the funders. So they know the transparency. Yeah. And then, of course, my job is on the field. I do two things. I go around giving talks and do the interviews like what I'm doing with you now. Yeah. And I'm on site designing responses and, in, and, and interventions for critical and new disasters. All disaster type of disasters, fire, I don't have to tell my team what to do. <laughs> but they know what to do. Because you've seen most they, disasters They've been all over. They've been with me, so they know what to do. Yes. Like, Kabeha, okay, I need to really look at the whole thing. What's the best options to do here? Yeah. So I design a model, and then all the engineers of the municipality come and sit and talk to me, <laughs> and we say, this is what we're going to do. And we roll out the plan together. So we fight with the government, but we work with the government. That's it. Yes, we do yes. it together. Well, I like the statement, and I, not that I appreciate it. You fight with government, but you find a way through. Uh, you know, because you're not asking for, for tenders. You're not asking for a job. You're saying, I ha I'm here, I'm giving you water. Yes. So where do I put it, essentially? And, and you initially, Elia said, you don't struggle to get them to agree to half of the stuff that you do. If they call me? Yes. And when they come, even if they don't call us, you know, when we get there, to be fair to them, they're very grateful. Yeah. And they tell you, you know what? You know, there's no budget. And, you know, we got no help. And you, you saved us. They tell you that. You saved us. You helped our people. We really appreciate that. Yeah. And the lady who has been going over the top right now is the Premier of the Free State. She's singing our praises in every corner of the province. Wow. Tell her to fix the roads. <laughs> <laughs> when next time you speak to her, I was in Fixbeck uh, two weeks ago. I was very upset because these are roads that I've seen, I know, and now I can't drive on anymore. What are some of the, the challenges that South Africans are struggling with right now that you see on a daily basis? Hunger is a problem and so Job forth. Loss. No, no jobs, yeah. unemployment. And that's why I'm asking corporates to take young people in and give them apprenticeships. Yeah. Besides the stuff that you got, give them an apprenticeship and give them a stipend. You know, some kind of money, they can go home and look after their families. But more than that, the money, it will give the guy self-worth. So when I say guy, I mean hmm. men and women. Yeah. Self-esteem, self-worth, dignity, positivity, experience, new ideas, learn from other people mm. and get motivation. Then to study and sit at home, it breaks you when there's no opportunity to do anything. Mm. And we need to give these kids an opportunity. And it's an expense. The tax, you write it off from the tax, you know. Yeah. yeah it's, it's an expense. Let's give our kids an opportunity and let's give them apprenticeships, whether it's in farming, whether it's in cash register in the supermarket, whether it's in a franchise shop, whatever it is, candle beater, plumber, carpenter, let's just take them on and give them the skills. Yeah. Uh, what is your leadership style? No micromanagement. I I'll allow my teams to do whatever they want to do. Yeah. After they've, they've learned from me, obviously. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> yeah. And if they're, they're going to make mistakes, and I know they're going to make mistakes, I allow them to make the mistakes because it's, it's not going to be any reputational damage. It's fine. Then it's a learning process. And they never make the mistake again. Have you ever dealt with a, a, a crisis of, of, of reputational management? No, no. Fortunately no, not. No, no, never. Yeah. Because we, 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 we know in advance what to, to sort out, you know, to make sure what they can do and what they can't do. Yeah. And we, when you leave them, you know, they say, be, be, delegate. That thing doesn't work with me. Mm. When I delegate, 10 people, they come with 50 new ideas. <laughs> and they come with 50 new projects each. Yes. You know what? And, and, they, and when you leave them, they get so happy. They come up with new ideas, they new systems. And quite often, you know what? I think that's a good system. Yeah. In terms of also uh, management, for the last few disasters that we went out, I never let the teams. I stayed behind. Mm -hmm. I didn't go with the first team. I let the first teams go, see what they have to do, implement the program. And I said, you know what? The organization is in safe hands. Mm -hmm. My guys know what to do. <laughs> so, so you know, should we be hit by a bus, God forbid, tomorrow? The gift of the givers will carry on. Yeah, yeah. No, it'll carry on. I, I, we've already put a system, since 2017. We've been putting systems in place. All my guys know their work. So I only there to hold the things together. Pretty much. Uh, yeah. And, and of course, 
I'm the face of the organization. Yes. Everybody wants to talk to me. That's uh. the problem, right? <laughs> of course, a lot of my teams have now been interviewed by media. I tell them, you go to the meeting, you go to arrangement, you speak yeah. to the people, yeah. you'll be on the ground, kind of stuff. So they do that. But just the skills, and of course, I'm the spiritual link. Mm. The spiritual link is very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's passing on, you know, and, and 80%, if I drop dead now, 80% of what can be done will carry on, but no, effortless. Has, has any family member joined it? Yes, my son. You know, my son, he's, he's, he's traveled with me lots of times whilst he was still studying. Mm. He's a computer engineer. He put up satellites for us in Syria. Wow. And then suddenly he asked, he wants to join. So I told him, are you sure you're going to do this? Because there's no family life. So, so, so doing it now full time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. And he left a very lucrative job for DSTV, Jeez. you know, and took a major knock in salary. And so when I went to the spiritual teacher, I said, my son wants to join as a courtesy. I'm asking you. So yeah, he told me, what took him so long? <laughs> He said, you got bigger things coming. And it was 2016. And we can see what bigger things Ooh, came. A so lot of bigger things came. came. Yeah. The last three years have been a movie. And, and my wife, of course, she was co-founder with me. In the beginning, she, yeah. She's been there from the beginning. When I'm traveling, she's talking to the Reserve Bank. She's talking to the donors. They want to know something. She's talking to the people. She set up the counseling service. She's growing that. So she's always been there from the beginning. Yeah. She's met the spiritual teacher. She's also a, a, you know, a, a sort of a devotee of the, the spiritual teacher. Mm -hmm. So she's been there. You know, it's an unfair question to ask someone who's done as much as you've done. If you were a musician, you would have released hundreds of albums. Yes. Uh, so it's unfair to say some of your proudest projects. Because a disaster is not a proud moment. Sure. But projects that you look back and, and, and reflect and say, you know, you, you, you're glad you've started this. You know, COVID. 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 It always goes back to COVID. Yeah. If anything demoralized, broke, killed, and brought hardship and difficulty was COVID. You see, you can only, you can talk about how good you are and how skilled you are, but until you're put to the test, you won't know. Mm. And my teams, both my normal volunteer, full-time staff and my medical teams came, rose above the, the challenge. Wow. They came with flying colors. When the moment I said on my medical chat, COVID, guys, who's ready? Every single guy in that chat put an up hand, you know, wow. to show we are ready. Where you need us, Wherever the crisis is, we're coming, you're not afraid. We are here to serve. What? The medical, the, the non-medical the non teams who deliver the food parcels, the soup kitchens, the PPEs to the hospitals, all worked 365 days a year. Dwayne took all the chances, yeah. went in everywhere. And of course, this is a disaster that lasted over two and a half, two years. Yes. It's not a three-day disaster. Part of it still carries on. Oh, yeah. We're dealing with people who are dying now in yeah. China. Yeah. A part of it still carries on. So it's the longest disaster, the most complicated, the most loss of lives, the most challenging. And it, it has caused a lot of mental health issues among healthcare workers, police, teachers, kids, parents who lost their kids, yeah. kids who lost their parents, and those who lost their jobs. The fear, the anxiety, it's caused a lot of mental issues. And to me, it's the defining mm. factor mm. in how a country responds to a disaster and how people are resilient and how people are coming out of it. It's, and, and also, it's in my own country. Yeah. It's something that I responded to in my own country. Yes, we do great deals in other countries, but this, we know, we can sit back and say to the teams, we did it. You yes. Know, 210 <laughs> hospitals, PEPs to everybody, 4,000 CA, the oxygen machines, ventilators, CA, video laryngoscopes, dedicated COVID wards, oxygen <laughs> points, 10 <laughs> testing teams. And the, the, the retail, the, the pri private sector price was 1450 We brought it down to 600 Jeez. She all had to drop the prices. <laughs> and, and we had mobile teams, testing the cricket teams, testing the soccer teams, to going mess employees. Our guys came to the party and they stood out, delivered 1.4 million food parcels, hundreds of soup kitchens, you know, in, in uh, 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 what's it, upgraded hospitals, mm. infrastructure upgrade, put in walls in hospitals at a critical time, sanitizer, paid for staff to support existing hospitals, changed the internal configuration of systems, going to the doctors just to talk to them. My friend, how are you doing? Are you okay? Thank you very much for coming. Yeah. We were feeling down. We were feeling out of energy. Thank you for coming. So I go just to sit and spend time with them to talk to them, to say you guys are doing a great job. Mm. Then we have hospital heroes. We have a good impact for them. They can afford it. Yes. But, but, but it comes from outside. Yeah. It's like, it's more, far more expensive for the same thing if you buy it from the shop. It's like, you see me. You see me. Yeah, we yeah. appreciate what you're doing. Uh. And it builds such a camaraderie in the country. It's undoubtedly the greatest project ever in my history. Your team and their own motivation, because that's also something you have to deal with. What happens there? It's a calling. I told you. We, yeah. we, we, we're on the chats all the time. Every single day, we got messages. We talk to each other. Mm. We visit each other. We set up training programs. We meet. 
we upgrade. We have skills. We upgrade our equipment. Mm. Anybody has a problem, they call. You know, five people will respond or private message me. I'll do this. I'll come and meet you. We'll do this. I'll come to your house. <laughs> the, the team is one family. One guy is sick. The whole team is sick. Oh. You got a problem. We all got a problem. Yeah. We all stand by you. So the spirit of what you do for strangers in inverted commas, for disasters, it's the same spirit that you bring to your own team. Well, my rule is very clear. My teams come first. If you've got to choose between my team dying and somebody else dying, somebody else dies. Yes. My team doesn't die. Yeah. So I said, we don't go that risk. We come first. Yes. If we're not there, we can't help anybody else. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. So we come first and we have systems that support each other all the time. A guy has got a problem, he'll, he knows who to call and we'll try to solve the problem. The, during COVID, they called him. My hospital is in trouble. I don't know what to do. I'm depressed. Boom. Four <laughs> hours later, the stuff is there. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Have you had people call you to say, whether it's different countries, different companies, different rich people, for example, saying we want to duplicate your model in our country, in our system? Have you had someone ask you, how do you do it so we, want to, we can do it elsewhere? A lot of people have asked me that. Yeah. Right? And, you know, and they, they say we watch you, watch your social media pages, but they say the kind of things you do, we can't do. <laughs> it's, it's, That's it's, why it's, it's so surprising yeah, yeah, that you continue to do they it. They said we, we can't do it. And, of course, the other thing with us is we don't look at race, religion, color, or class. And a lot of people tell us, look, we're being honest with you, we can only do it for our group. Ah. We can't do it beyond our group. We can't understand how you guys do it. We're and a group is color or color religion or, religion or, or yes. You know, or, or race. Kind yeah. of stuff, yeah. And it's, they say, we can't do it. We, they say, we wish we could get out of our skin and do it the way you guys do it. But we admire you. We're sorry. But we fixed in our thinking. We can only do it like this. Huh. But clearly, that's a, that's a, a disability. Yes. For, for one to know that yeah. they can do better, yeah. but it, I just can't move beyond this. Yes. It's such Maybe a some point. Yes, eventually, yeah. But you've had people saying, hey, help draw up a model for us so we can create it in another country. I said, this thing can't be done on paper. It has to be in the ground. Yeah. Disaster is not in the books. <laughs> if you think you're telling me you write a whole book on disasters, I haven't been there. I'll tell you, throw your book away. It's not going to work. Jeez. What's, what, what's still coming for you in your thinking? The, the, the infrastructure upgrade, the teachers, the doctors, the water, the job creation. But to me, more than anything, I'm waiting to see spirituality comes. Mm. Spirituality comes, ethics comes, values comes, morality comes. We don't need policemen. We don't have to worry about corruption. We don't have to worry about money. It'll be lying there. Nobody will take it. It will grow. It'll mm. look after itself. The, there'll be no poverty. People will be looked after. The, the country will grow. I'm looking to that stage, and it will come. I know yeah. that. And that's that's the South Africa you dream of. Yes, and it will happen. Yeah. You're a, you're a, a, a well-loved South African. Are you aware of the appreciation that yes. people have for you? Well, I get people to take hundreds of photographs every day with me. <laughs> you're like, you're a famous musician. Everywhere <laughs> I go, I'm, I'm getting I'm off a plane, I'm talking on a phone, and the guy comes, <laughs> <laughs> selfie, <laughs> and he just waves to me and he carries on. <laughs> I'm eating the restaurant, <laughs> selfie, <laughs> take pictures. A, woman, a lady jumps in front of me in the airport, takes a picture, Husband comes from the back, but you left me out. So can we take another <laughs> one? Take another <laughs> picture. Take, take another one. <laughs> so you carry on, eh? And now when I go to events, I have to allow 40 minutes to 50 minutes for the talk and Ooh. an hour for the pictures. Oh, no. Lady will come and say, oh, my eyes are closed. Oh, my hair was in my eyes. <laughs> Wait, I need to call me back again. <laughs> can, I go, can we go again? Can we go again? And then, okay, now we have a group photograph. And now I have an individual photograph. Mm. One hour. But it's love. And I say, it's fine. You, you, know, you, you let it be. I let it be because, you know, I don't hurt any... This, the, the, the spiritual lawyers, you don't hurt anybody's feelings. Do you have enough hours in the day? Or do you find that... You, you have know, to make it work. Yeah. The spiritual teacher, I, mean, I met him again. I was in Turkey last week, the new one. Uh. And he said, you need to make time for yourself. My first teacher told me when I started, he said, three thirds. One third for yourself, one third for your family, and one third for the work. Mm -hmm. I mean to take it 28 times. Every time I went back, I said, "Teacher, this formula doesn't work." <laughs> Which part? Which <laughs> part is <laughs> the no, all, all the stuff is going to the to the to, to the, the world, days. not to me, to my family. And I said, "Look, I don't create the disasters. I'm not responsible. <laughs> I only respond to them." <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if there were no disasters, yeah, well, every man, you'll have time to your family. And, and, and then he laughed. And then the new teacher said, "Look, you got to allow some time." I said, "I've been praying for that, but..." There is so much of crisis. I stopped traveling, not because of COVID only, but from July 2019, I took a decision not to travel overseas anymore. Yeah, unless if you are responding. Yeah, something really, really critical. People said, my country needs all my time. 
not that I'm a special person, but I got the skills. God has given me the gift. Yeah. I know how to do things. You know, and the teacher said, you will know what to do. So I want to use that for my country. I don't want to say, hey, this man is a great man. He did everything in 60 countries, but in South Africa, I felt He short. did very little, yeah. yeah. No, he, he, he danced everywhere else. Yeah. And no. we didn't know him here. Yes, it, it has to be home first because these people are looking for hope. And, you know, we need to bring that hope back to them. Yeah. And that's why I fight with the government. Because I don't need anything from them, to be honest. It's because I need... You need them to open the door so, so you can come and... Their, fix their own systems. Pretty much, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. You're basically, you're not saying, give me this. Yeah. You're saying, fix yourself. Do it yourself, but fix it properly. And in the right way, without extravagance. Amazing. Surely, uh, you know, when you have to react to a war, it's not an easy decision. Yes. It can't possibly be. Yes. Because you're dealing with irrational men yeah. <laughs> that are shooting each other. Yeah. And how, how tricky is the decision too? And once the decision is made and now you have to take people with you there, what happens to your, to your, to your measurement of risk and, and all of that? War is not like a, a acute disaster because it's a long-standing thing. True. So we don't respond immediately. And when you see the situation is getting critical and now the country can't manage and the refugees are getting more and the food is becoming less and the medical skills are dropping, that's when we decide to go in. Mm. When we go in, I go alone or mm. I take one guy with me and we go survey the terrain. And we say, okay, this is a good spot where we can work before we bring the teams. Mm. The strange thing is, I get more volunteers for a war than for a natural disaster. <laughs> and I tell them, you'll get shot, and you'll get killed, and you'll lose your eye, and you're, you know, you're a single parent, and what's going to happen to your mm. child? And they tell me, hey, we're adults. Yeah. We took a conscious decision. We're going to help. And they tell you the last part, or from all the religious groups, they tell you, you see, we're doing God's work. He will look after us. That's it. Yeah. Ever had to deal with a with a challenge? In, in Syria, two groups are fighting each other in hospital, shooting at each other. Ooh. My guys were in theater, and from under the table, they closed the patient, the fastest closure of a patient in history. <laughs> and then I called and went out, and I told the groups, you see this hospital, I'll shut it down. Yeah. And the leaders came, and they said, please, sorry, you know, we are backward people. And we don't know how to, we know, don't know etiquette. We shouldn't be fighting in hospital, but we make stupid things. Please, please, I beg you, please, please don't close this hospital. I said, nobody's allowed to put a car in front of my hospital because you guys got a habit of putting car bombs. And secondly, I don't want anybody <laughs> to guns. no guns in my hospital. Otherwise, I shut it down tomorrow and you and your families will die. Yeah. And I'm a very blunt guy. Next day, five cars come. Guys with boots, guns, running into the hospital with guns. Next minute, they run out of the hospital again. What the patients? With all the injured people, run out of the hospitals. They look at us. They give us a sheepish smile. Take out all the guns, all the ammunition, put it in the car, carry the patients and bring them back. <laughs> what was happening? What was that about? <laughs> <laughs> because they realized, because I told them, no guns in hospital. Yeah, so they remembered. They remembered after. Because they too used to running with guns in the hospital. <laughs> and they stopped and it never happened ever again. War is such a dumb thing. Have you been involved in this war that's taking place now? Which one? Ukraine. Yes, we, we, we're not involved directly. As I said, I'm not sending teams, but we trained them how to look after their own people. Yeah. We funded a lot of stuff. We're still funding the war. Yes. You know, the, 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 the victims. Yeah. So we've trained the Ukrainian people how to look after themselves. We gave them a crash course in disaster management and they're working like geniuses. <laughs> and that's actually something else that you would it's do. A new, it's a new field. You know, like telemedicine, uh, you know, virtual the disaster yes. implementation. It's a new thing and they're doing exceptionally well. I guided them from the beginning what to do. You're a great South African. We, we are very lucky, uh, South Africa, to have you. Uh, to call you one of us. Imagine you, Elon Musk, who left us so many years ago. You are here with us. Uh, and, and we say to you, thank you so much. Thank you for being a South African. And thank you for, for choosing South Africa first. And, 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 and we'll always, always appreciate you. And we, we, I'm grateful for your ease of response uh, to media you know you've picked up my calls <laughs> you know you're that kind of guy and i say to you thank you again we truly truly appreciate you you're an incredible incredible south african and the, the awards i've noticed in some of your interviews you do them just because but they don't really mean much to you it's about solving people's problems yeah, and as the teacher said it's done through you so i'm not doing it you know yeah. and, and of course i do the, the award if you can't again hurt people's feelings you know, yeah, if they I, give I, you an award. I, I appreciate it. You go and show the respect for it. You take it. But you can't do this alone. No. It's a recognition of... Because even the person who prays for me at night, mm. we don't know how effective that prayer is. They couldn't give money, but they got up at night to pray. Are they not counted? Yeah. That's one of the reasons we don't ever have functions. They said, 30th anniversary, what function are you having? So I said, what function am I having? I'm going to invite rich people. <laughs> who am I going to invite? 
only people who give rich people who give money. Yeah. What about the poor guy who gave fifty rand and only a hundred rand in his pocket? Who's more I mean? important? Yes. What about the lady who got up to pray for us, who gave good wishes? I invite nobody. There is just no function. For thirty years, we've never had a function. We never had a let's let's no. pomp and the ceremony. The only function we have is training our staff. Nothing else. Yeah, but and no outsiders in our functions. You are a hero, absolute hero. We're very lucky. I get very emotional when I think about the work you do. How lucky we are to have you! It's quite quite amazing. Thank you very much. Yes. He's a doctor. We decided not to do doctoring, uh, to doctor our souls now, because now you're telling us we can change and be better people. Yes. And we should be. That's true. Thank you very very much. It's a gift of the givers and team. Because we have to acknowledge yeah, the whole the game. Team. It's not individual, and of course the donors and the supporters and the media and the public. We all build this together. Yeah. yeah. It's Doctor MTS Suleiman, everybody. King King David Studio Podcast.